morning, Upward. It is so good to see you all today. We're continuing our series called Heal Our Land, and we're believing God to bring healing to our nation, to the United States of America. I still believe healing is possible, and I still believe God wants to do a healing in this nation according to his word. We're looking at a famous Old Testament prophet that God offered to King Solomon. King Solomon had built a temple to God that was worth like $30 billion, a, a, an unthinkable sum to spend on the temple. Uh, Solomon had built this glorious place, and God had poured out his presence in the dedication service of the temple. Fire literally came down. God's glorious fire came down into that temple, and the presence of God was manifest in that place in such a powerful way. Solomon goes home after that event, and God made him a promise. God said, there are going to be times after this glorious event when you drift away from me. And when you drift away from me, consequences are going to come, difficulties are going to come, and you're going to recognize that the difficulties came because you drifted away from me. When that happens, here's what you do. And he gave him this promise. He said, then, at that moment, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will restore or heal their land. God gives a big word that says if. And he said, if my people, not the politicians, not the people on the outside, if my people, the church, will humble themselves, if they will pray, if they will seek my face, and if they will turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Today we're on the fourth one. We've talked about humbling ourselves. We've talked about praying. We've talked about seeking God's face. Today this is a tough message, so I want you to get ready. I'm really trying today to, to walk that boundary of grace and truth. I want to bring you the truth in an uncompromised way Yet at the same time, I want to offer grace to people who struggle. And that's what Jesus does. It says this about Jesus. He's full of grace and truth. He tells us the truth, but he does it in such a way that grace comes to us and we realize we're not hopeless. We don't feel condemned or beat down, but we're actually drawn to the truth of his word. And I'm praying that happens today. We're talking about turning from our wicked ways. And one of the most joyful things to see is to see someone who's lost to repent and come to Jesus. Isn't it glorious to see that? I just love it when that happens. The Bible's full of those stories. You have a man named Saul in the New Testament. Saul persecuted the early church right after it was born and tried to destroy it. He had people put in prison, but he met Jesus through a supernatural encounter on a roadside. He saw a great light, fell to the ground. Jesus spoke to him out of that light, and Saul was converted. His name was changed to Paul, and he became the greatest missionary in Christian history. In fact, he wrote most of the New Testament. Isn't it exciting to know that a great big sinner wrote most of the New Testament, a sinner that Jesus reached, right? There's a beautiful story in the Bible of this lady coming in, and Jesus is at a man's house having dinner, and this lady comes in with this beautiful box of perfume. And she breaks it on Jesus' feet in one of the most beautiful acts of worship in all the Bible. But yet she was condemned by some because this woman, the Bible said, was a woman who had a real bad history and a terrible past. She was a great sinner. It's always a beautiful story when a great sinner meets a greater Savior, isn't it? A great sinner meets a greater Savior. And I love that. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you're struggling with right now. I don't care what you did last night. The Bible said God commends his love to us. God sends his love to us through Christ dying for us when we were lost, when we were sinners. If you struggle this morning and you think, what am I doing in here among all these good-looking, righteous people? Thanks for thinking we're good-looking. We try our best. But we're not as righteous as we look because all of us have been there and done that to some degree or another. You may be watching this morning online for the first time and you think, man, this group of Christians, uh, they are just too good for me. Let me tell you, every one of us is a sinner who's been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. We've met a great Savior and he's changed our lives. And I love to hear those stories. Once in a while, somebody will come to me. It's happened on multiple occasions. Somebody will say, is it really true? I'll say, what? 
does so-and-so really come to church now? I'll say, yeah, he comes here. I don't believe it. There's no way. I remember when he was an addict. I remember when he ran around with me and did terrible things. I cannot believe this guy actually comes to church now. And I have a good response to that. I tell him, well, come and see for yourself. And they do, and they're shocked. If you look around today, you'll see some people who used to be addicted to drugs. If you look around today, you'll see some people who were caught up in sexual sin. If you look around today, you'll see some husbands and wives sitting together, maybe even holding hands here today, who at one point their marriage was about to be destroyed by the enemy. But great sinners met a great Savior, and he turned their lives around. And God wants us today to meet that great Savior. And God wants us individually and nationally to turn away from our wicked ways and turn to God. And when we do that, he will bring healing in our land. There's an Old Testament king who was a huge sinner (coughs) that not a lot of people know about. His name was Manasseh. Manasseh had a great father. His father was one of three good kings in the Old Testament, one of three good kings after Solomon in the, New, in the Old Testament named Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a wonderful king. He lived for the Lord all his life. There was a time when Hezekiah was about to die and he prayed and God healed him and extended his life for 15 years. Just a couple of years into that 15-year extension, he had a son named Manasseh. The sad thing often is, though, that children don't follow in the ways of their parents the godly way. There are many tragedies in Scripture that come about because people failed to pass their faith from one generation to the next. You understand this? You can't give salvation to your children. You can't just give forgiveness to them. Each generation has to follow God and make a decision to follow Christ for itself. Each generation has to do that. And I want you to understand me today. If you have a child who's struggling in their faith, you keep praying, you keep believing, you keep setting a good example for them, and you just believe Jesus to do a work in their lives. And and you just keep on believing, and he will do that thing. I believe that with all of my heart. I'm praying with you for your children to come in. Hezekiah uh, didn't live to see all the evil, but Manasseh, following the great example of his father, came be- be- became one of the worst kings in the history of the nation. He sinned in a huge way. Second Chronicles 33 tells us a little bit about the sins of Manasseh. It says in verse 1, Manasseh was 12, year old, 12 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He followed the detestable practices of the pagan nations that the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. He rebuilt the pagan shrines his father had broken down. Do you understand that? He's rebuilding what his godly father had broken down. And he's tearing down things that his father had built up. Whenever a generation rises up that tears down good things and builds up evil things, that generation is in trouble. And that's what happened with Manasseh. It says in verse uh, 3, he rebuilt these pagan shrines. He constructed altars for the images of Baal. These are false gods that the people constructed uh, for themselves. He set up Asherah pole, Asherah being a false goddess of fertility. He also bowed down before the powers of heavens and worshipped them. He began to worship the stars and the sun and moon and give them power that should only belong to God. said he built the pagan altars in the temple of the Lord. This was especially evil. He did not build a pagan idolatrous altar out on a hillside somewhere. He built it right in God's temple that Solomon had built. It's a place of glory for God. Imagine that place where God's fire and glory was poured out. Now there's a pagan idol right in the middle of it. That's what Manasseh did. He built, verse 4 says, the altars for all the powers of the heavens in both courtyards of the Lord's temple. Then verse 6 goes to a whole new level. Unheard of in Israel, but Manasseh also sacrificed his own sons in the fire in the valley of Ben-Hinnom. He sacrificed his own children to false gods. He practiced sorcery, divination, and witchcraft, and he consulted with mediums and psychics. He did much that was evil in the Lord's sight, arousing his anger. He even took a carved idol he had made and set it up in God's temple. I want to tell you, Manasseh and his life tells us three things that societies that depart from God do. I've learned this. When societies depart from God, they tend to do the very same things again and again and again. 
Now, I want you to hear me today. I'm going to point out what I believe is wickedness in our nation today, but I want you to hear me. Jesus Christ has grace for the sinner. And if you've been struggling with any of these things and these things have afflicted your life, I'm not condemning you. I'm not knocking you today. I'm not trying to pile condemnation on you. I want to be a witness to the truth while at the same time ministering the grace of Jesus Christ to people who have struggled with those things. But I want to be an uncompromised witness to the truth this morning and tell you what Manasseh did is being repeated in our nation today. Societies that depart from God, first of all, tend to lower their own standards. Instead of raising high the standards of morality and the standards of truth, societies that depart from God tend to let the culture dictate how they live and what they believe. You remember what it said of Manasseh? They were called, Israel was called by God to bear his name before the world. Israel was called by God to be a witness to the world of who God is. And that's what we're called to be as the church of Jesus Christ. We're called to be a witness to the world of who God is. We're to show his power on earth. You remember Jesus prayed this in the Lord's Prayer. He said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He says that we are to pray to bring heavenly realities down to earth and manifest the ways of heaven in our earthly life. Can I get an amen? I know too many Christians who just want to go to heaven and I don't know enough who want to manifest heaven in their daily lives. And that's what we need to be as a church, and that's what we're called. We're called to manifest the presence of Jesus in our lives, in our families, in our communities. But we can't do that when we adopt the standards of culture into our lives. We're called to influence culture, not to adopt all their standards into our lives. We've lowered our standards in the United States of America. And I want to tell you, I think one of the ways we've lowered our standards is we've tried to redefine things that God ordained. And government has no right whatsoever to redefine something that wasn't their idea in the first place. When we start trying to redefine marriage, we get into something that we didn't invent in the first place. And we cannot shape it to be what we want it to be according to our own feelings, according to our own struggles, and according to our own convenience. Pastor Andy knocking people with sexual struggles or identity struggles, I'm not for a minute. If you're here, you're watching online, and that's a struggle of yours, I want to tell you, we love you, and Jesus Christ loves you. We will not knock you. We will not condemn you. We're not here to make you feel horrible about yourself. We're here to hold out the truth of Jesus Christ. But I want you to understand something today. You want there to be a standard. You want there to be a standard. Spoke not long ago with a, with a precious young man, and, and it was just a great guy and a very respectful guy. And we had a, a long conversation, and he was living a, a lifestyle that, that I did not agree with. And he asked me about it. I'd invited him to come to church, and he asked me about it. And he asked me if, if, if that lifestyle, if we accepted that lifestyle. And I said, I'll tell you what, hear me on this. I said, I can accept you as a person without agreeing with everything that you do. That, that's a distinction in our country that we've lost. We think we just have to throw out the whole person. I said, I can love you as a person without being in agreement with everything you do in your life. Amen. And this young man, well, kindest young man, and I, I hope to have a long friendship with this young man, but he said he had visited a church trying to find a church that would be okay with his lifestyle. And he had visited a church that basically had no creed and no covenant. Anybody could come and do anything. And he told me this. He said it felt kind of empty because there was no standard. That's right. That's right. And I thought in the midst of trying to create our own standards, there's, there's an empty void there that we want some standards. We want some truth. I love people that struggle with all kinds of things. And it's wrong of us to, to pick out one particular sexual sin and make it the one thing we throw out people from the church when we deal a lot of times with sexual sin inside the church. You with me today? We don't have any kind of high horse we can get on and point fingers at anybody else. We're called to love the world. We're not called to police the world. Amen. 
But we're going to talk about what God ordained to be holy matrimony. And we're going to sound the truth of the fact that government does not have the right to just make that anything they want it to be. What happens is we lower our standards to match the culture around us rather than holding high the standards that God has set for us. That's what happens in a society that departs from God. Second thing that happens in a society that departs from God is they create their own gods. They lower their own standards and they create their own gods. You ever hear people say, well, I'm not religious. I promise you everybody has a God. Did you know that everybody is a worshiper? Did you know that everybody, you are a worshiper. Heard people say, you know, I come to church and I'm just kind of quiet. I'm not really a worshiper. We're all worshipers. People that say there's no God may walk away from church, may walk away from faith, may walk away from religion, and they'll go right out away from religion and they'll make a God for themselves. You were made to worship. The Bible says God has put eternity in our hearts. There is a longing on the inside of every one of us for something that is greater than what we're experiencing. He's put eternity in here. One of the key things that that prove to me the existence of God is the longing in the human heart for eternity. If that wasn't in there, we would be pretty satisfied with life. I mean, we've got it great in this country. We've got plenty of food to eat. We've got a warm place to stay. We've got cars to drive us around. We've got a pretty good economy. I mean, we've got to come. Why are we never happy? Because God has put a longing down deep in our hearts for eternity that nothing but him can satisfy. Nothing but a relationship with him can satisfy. And we can go searching all over the world. In fact, we will search for something to worship wherever you put us. You can go in the most remote parts of the world into people who've, who've never experienced the outside world and you will find some form of worship happening in that place in a remote part of the world. Why? We're wired to worship. It's just in us. We're created in the image of God. Do you ever see people who, uh, who, who say, now, now we're Pentecostal, so we get a little crazy once in a while, and that's okay. We, we, we get loud once in a while. Is that all right? We lift our hands. Everybody just lift your hands up right now. Just lift them high. Say, you're Pentecostal now. <laughs> you didn't realize it would happen so fast, but some of you, first time you ever lifted your hands in church. So next week when you come to church, you're just going to woo, it's good. I'm a Pentecostal now. We got you, just like that. We clap our hands in worship, right? We applaud. Sometimes we dance. Now, you don't want to see me dancing. People say, Pastor, I've never seen you dance. Well, you just better thank the Lord that you've never seen that. God has protected you from something that could blind you because I'm so terrible at dancing. You don't want to see me dancing, but we do that. And it's in the Bible. David danced before the Lord. There's all these expressions of worship. And I laugh sometimes when people say I'm not a worshiper because all you got to do is go to a ball game and you'll see people worshiping. You'll see them demonstrating every one of the physical manifestations of worship in the scripture. You go to a concert that somebody loved, you'll see them (laughs) clapping, dancing. I I may have told you this, forgive me. My wife and I love 80s music, and we went to see Chicago in Asheville. Anybody love Chicago? Oh, I just love Chicago. We went up to Asheville to see Chicago, and we're the youngest people at the concert. I didn't realize how old these bands are now. The youngest people there, I said, babe, we're, we're the kids here. And uh, there were older people just hands up. There was a guy dancing, and oh, he was trying hard, but oh, it was terrible. <laughs> you even see people at these concerts just rush the stage. I mean, it looks like an altar call. And what was so funny at Chicago, they had this guy at the stage, he looked like he was about 80. He rushed the stage, as rush as you can when you're 80. He's right down here, up in the band's face, and the police came to get him away. You know how that happens at concerts? The police were actually helping this guy back to his seat. He was like this, and they helped him go sit down. I thought, this is my tribe now. These are my people now. (laughs) But when you go to a sporting event or a concert, you'll see people mimicking worship without even knowing it because we're wired to worship. Manasseh and the people, they created their own gods. What is God? Anything you look to as the source of life other than God becomes an idol in your life. 
anything you look to for fulfillment other than him. You see, God wants to be your everything. God wants to be your source of life and hope and peace and strength. And any time you looked at somebody else or to something or somebody else to be that, it becomes an idol in your life. You'll make gods. That's what society does, and we've done that. The last one and the most horrific thing that Manasseh did, in my opinion, is, is societies that depart from God begin to sacrifice their own children. And one of the greatest sins today in the United States of America are the millions of children that are being aborted in our nation right now. The preborn children, human beings from the point of conception. I want you to hear that today. Human beings from the point of conception that we remove from the womb. Now I want you to hear me today. If you're a young lady and you've had an abortion, we're not here to beat you up this morning. And I don't want you to leave this place this morning. You may be watching online. I don't want you to leave this time together this morning and feel beaten up and condemned. Many of us can't even begin to understand the confusion and the turmoil that you were in when you made that decision. And you live with that decision. And that's a hard thing for you to live with today. Jesus loves you. He will forgive you. He can redeem your life and turn around your life and put you on a good course and get you through that. And we believe that. And we do not throw condemnation at you this morning if you've done that. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge the truth of what that is and to acknowledge that as a nation, we've tolerated abortion in our nation. I want to tell you this. And one of the things that makes me struggle so hard is this. If you're a young mom, or maybe you're a potential young mom, maybe some of you young ladies may find yourself in this situation somewhere down the road. I want you to hear me this morning. If you're ever in that situation, don't be afraid to come to us. We will not condemn you. We will not kick you out. We're not going to point our fingers at you and say you messed up because we've messed up too. Last time I checked, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and you're no exception, and neither am I. Don't ever be afraid to come to God's people. Don't ever be afraid to come to me or one of these precious people in this church and tell us the situation you're in. But do not take that baby's life. Do not abort that baby. There is hope. Because every time there's someone over here considering abortion, there's somebody across town that's battling infertility. And they want to have a child so bad. And they would take that child and they would raise that child. And that child would have an opportunity to live so if you're ever in that situation, reach out to us. I won't tell you all the stories. I can't tell you, but many times in the history of our church, we've been able to connect a mom who was considering an abortion with a family that wanted a baby, and that child was able to live. And I can tell you, multiple babies have been saved by this congregation as Jesus has touched and ministered those situations. So do that. But as a nation, we need to repent. I don't preach politics because I don't believe abortion is a political issue. I believe it's a moral issue, and the church needs to have a voice for life. And when I'm talking to a politician, I'm saying, where do you stand on life of unborn children? And what are you going to do? I think somehow in our nation, we've got to make the connection between crisis pregnancies and, and couples struggling with infertility. And we've got to get those kids connected somehow. I don't have all the answers, but somehow as a nation, we need to repent and let our unborn children live. Manasseh participated in the sacrifice of his own sons. Now... Here's what happens. This is the thing about God. God had warned Israel about this from the beginning. This is not something he surprised them with over and over. You can read it in the, in the books of the law. You can read it in the book of Deuteronomy. There are blessings for obedience. God's saying you do the right thing. All kinds of blessings are coming your way. But if you stray off the path, bad things are going to happen. And they're not punishment per se. They're, they're my ways of pulling you back on the path. They're my warnings to you. But bad things happen. Dire consequences come when societies depart from God. It said in verse 10, The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they ignored all his warnings. So the Lord sent the commanders of the Assyrian armies, and they took Manasseh prisoner. They put a ring through his nose, bound him in bronze chains, and led him away to Babylon. He was captured because of his wickedness and led away with a hook in his nose, a ring in his nose, and by chains he was taken to a foreign land named Babylon. It was in the 22nd year of his reign. Bad things happen when societies depart from God. 
There's a secular article right out right now out that I read online by a secular journalist who says there are 10 plagues actively working in the world today. And if you think about that, there's a health crisis in our world today with the coronavirus. Now, people of God, we believe in healing. About 10 of us here do. I said, people of God, we believe in healing. God does miraculous things. Michael Lane went into surgery this week. Michael's been battling cancer. Many of you know Michael. His mom's sitting right there. If she starts shouting, we're going to let her shout. They've been going through treatments, and I talked to Michael before he went into surgery last week. He said the treatments have worked. The tumor was had uh, shrank, can shrunk, shrank, which is it? English teachers, is it shrunk or shrank? You don't know either. Thank you, Caleb. The tumor had gotten significantly smaller. That sounded much smarter anyway. Thank you, Caleb. I'll call on you next time. He said the tumor was so much, the treatments had worked, and he said they're going to go in today and do surgery and remove the rest of the tumor. The only thing is, when they got in there, the great physician had already been there, and there was no cancer in his body when they got in there. God still heals. God still does the miraculous. Amen. So with the plagues in the world today, the people of God don't have to be afraid. But some consequences come as a result from departing from God. Disease is spreading. Crazy weather, weather patterns are happening in the world today like never before. Volcanic activity is happening in the world. There's actually a plague of locusts right now in, in Africa that seems to be in proportion to Old Testament plagues. Bad things happen. Dire consequences come as we depart from God. But here's the thing. Manasseh, in his time of affliction, when he's carried away with hooks in his nose to Babylon, guess what this guy did? He humbled himself. He repented. See, you have a choice when you go into affliction. When circumstances catch up with you, you can harden your heart and blame others, or you can take responsibility and humble yourself. You ever been around people who can't ever accept the consequences of their own actions? They're always victims to everything. Amen? I had a guy come to me one time. He said, Pastor, I just, I'm having a hard time keeping a job. I've had 15 jobs in the last 10 years. I said, Man, that is tough. What's the problem? He said, well, the bosses all have a bad attitude. <laughs> They're always trying to tell me what to do. And I had to have a good word of counsel with this guy and say, okay, they pay you, right? Yeah. Well, you've got a job description, right? Yeah. Well, don't you think you're supposed to do that? Yeah, but they could be nicer about it. Well, probably they weren't so nice about it because they told you once and you wouldn't do what you were supposed to do. And they're not going to pay you for sitting around all day. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what you get when you come for me for counseling. That's what you'll get. I'll just tell you. He kept telling me bosses were bad. I'd go to the next job. And the problem with this kid is they expected him to work everywhere he went. <laughs> Imagine that. What were they thinking? There are bad bosses and there are bad situations and there are jobs you have to leave. But after you've had 15 and it's the same problem, you might start to get the hint that you could be a big part of the problem. Can I get an amen? amen. But sometimes we won't accept responsibility. I can tell you, I've called mo caused most of the trouble in my own life. My bad decisions. I can't even blame the devil for a lot of my stuff because most of it I just walked right into but when you get to that point, when you're afflicted by your own circumstances and the consequences of your own sin, don't bow up and get mad and determine that you're going to go your own direction. Humble yourself before God like Manasseh did. In his affliction, this wicked king turned to God. It says this, 2 Chronicles 33, 13. And Manasseh finally realized that the Lord alone is God. That's what repentance is. It's recognizing the Lord alone as God. To repent is to recognize the Lord is God. To repent is also to humble yourself before Him. It said, while in deep distress, verse 12, Manasseh sought the Lord his God and sincerely humbled himself before the God of his ancestors. His affliction brought him to a place of humility when he simply said, 
Lord, I humble myself before you. I acknowledge that you are the Lord over all. Some of you just need to give up and let God be God in your life. You fought hard enough. You fought long enough. You've struggled for a long time against what God was trying to do in your life. And he's gently calling you to him. To repent thirdly is to obey God. To just obey him. Here's what happened when when Manasseh humbled himself, God sent him back to his kingdom. He was released. He was able to go back to being king and he began to obey God. He rebuilt the walls that had been torn down. He removed the idols and he began to restore proper worship. This is one of the greatest uh, cases, stories of repentance ever recorded in all the scripture because he humbled himself. Here's what repentance does in your life. 2 Chronicles 33, 13, it said, When he prayed, the Lord listened to him. Repentance gains God's ear. Some of you may be here today and you've messed up. Anybody? How about everybody? You may have messed up. You may have gone back the second time. Some of you may have gone back for thirds. Some of us, I might need to say. Anybody? How many have been back three times and got the t-shirt to prove it and the scars to prove it? It's hard to get away from sin because sin has a power over us. Sin has a power over us that has to be broken by Jesus Christ. When you repent, Jesus Christ comes into your heart and life. The Bible said he literally breaks the power of sin over us. Before Christ, you're going to sin. But when you come to him, he breaks that power, and you're not bound by it anymore. But you've messed up. You know how to get God to hear you? Repent and come to him in humility. And the Bible said he'll listen to you. You may have voices in your head that say you're not good enough to be here. You're not good enough to pray. I want you to hear God's word today that says when you humble yourself, he listens. Then it says this about him. I love it. It said, uh, God listened to him. And it said, God was moved by his request. The second thing repentance does is it moves the heart of God. It moves God's heart when he hears someone humbling themselves. And the last thing, repentance restores my calling. It puts me back in the place I'm supposed to be for him. I love this. Um, when we fail, sometimes we repent. We, we receive God's forgiveness, but we don't give ourselves a forgiveness. The enemy would like for you to walk around in shame for the rest of your life about what you did. I believe just about every person I've ever met has some sort of shameful thing they've done. Can we just see your hand this morning? We're all Pentecostal now, right? We're just lifting both hands now, so we all... You done anything shameful? Have you done anything that you really hope people don't find out about? Have you ever had the devil control you with that fear? He brings shame on our lives. The devil's good at shaming people. Making you always feel ashamed about what you did. I'll we'll tell you something, when you repent, it goes under the blood of Christ and it's gone said it's gone how many would like for God to just take your sins far away how far is far enough I mean what let's see what if God took our sins to uh, Transylvania County is that far enough and all the folks in Transylvania County said we don't want them Buncombe County Nah, that's not far enough either all the Buncombe County people are going to be what if we just send all our sins to South Carolina is that better? <laughs> We're too close to South Carolina for that to be acceptable. How about Texas? What if we could just ship our sins all to Texas? Would that be far enough? I said this in first service, and one of our board members came up to me and said, Pastor, don't say that. I'm on my way on a flight to Texas this afternoon. <laughs> How about California? Oh, you smart Alex. I knew, I knew I, when I said that this morning, said, send them all out there to those people. I was just at a, preached a pastor's conference in California in December and met some of those precious Christians in Northern California. Just loved our time. Would California be far enough? How far would you like God to take us? The Bible tells us how far. 
It says, He has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. Now, I'm so glad he didn't say north to south because we can measure that. Are you with me? If you start going north today and keep going north, you'll come to the North Pole. And when you cross the North Pole, you will begin to head south. Then when you get to the South Pole, you'll start north again. There is a finite distance between north and south. But I want you to hear me. God said this and represented it well. You can go east this morning and never stop going east. You can go east forever. What does it mean? God has removed our sins infinity away from us. God's forgotten it. Why haven't you? God's washed it away. Why are you still letting the enemy bring it back up? Somebody said this is the greatest system of forgiveness or greatest confession of forgiveness. You ready? I did it. I admit it. I quit it. So you forget it. I did it. There's something powerful. Just, hey, I did it. How many people have ruined their lives and the cover-up was worse than the initial crime? How many business leaders and politicians and pastors have gone to jail because of covering up by just not being willing to say, I did it? I admit it. And the powerful part, I quit it. It's not part of my life now. Now let's forget it. That's what repentance is. Move on. Leave it in the sea of God's forgetfulness. It's what Manasseh did. As a nation, there's some things we need to repent over. Say, Pastor, I can't repent for the whole nation. You can make a difference in your world. You can make a difference in the people that come in contact with you. When I walk in repentance, I'm able to be a light to other people. So many people have been a light to me this week. I've just been so blessed. I don't know if you saw on the news lately about my crazy hard drive that I lost. Did anybody see that this week and thought, oh, that was so crazy. I lost that thing. Well, I was in California and Oklahoma, and I flew back, and I had a hard drive that had hundreds of pictures of my children, hundreds of pictures of the history of this church in it. All the pictures of us constructing this church were on that hard drive. I had church documents and everything. The overwhelming response that I've gotten from people after this story is, have you never heard of Dropbox, Pastor? <laughs> have you got that thing backed up? Because I had no backup and dropped it on a plane. It's gone for three months. But God had a guy who just before that thing was going to be discarded in Asheville said, I'm going to find out who owns this thing. And searched me online and got that thing back to me. And I got to meet this guy last night. And I'll be forever grateful for somebody. As a church, we're grateful for a lot of our history was on that hard drive. And I never thought I'd see it again. But somebody who was just doing the right thing made a difference in my life. I was at the grocery store this week. And uh, you ever get in a line at the grocery store? Do you ever go up and down the cashiers and find the shortest one? Shortest line, not the shortest cashier, but the shortest <laughs> line. <laughs> you ever do that? How many of you go through and you, you just look up the aisle to see which one's the fastest? And you really don't have anywhere to go. You understand? You can be in a hurry without going anywhere. The next series, that we're gonna, this ends this series, we're starting the next series. It's going to be called Hurry. And we're going to talk about how hurry is the enemy of a deep spiritual life. How rushing has taken all the depth out of our relationship with Jesus. So I was in a line and the cashier just started having a conversation with me. And there were people behind me getting irritated. But the guy just kept talking. And he said to me, he, he, you know how when you check out, sometimes they'll spit out coupons. And, and a lot of times I'll get coupons I'll never use. I was, I was, I've seen this. It sends me coupons for baby formula. And, and that is not Jesus speaking anything to me. I'm just not claiming that right now. Jesus is not telling me to have another baby. But I just got baby formula. And the cashier told me, he said, you know, we get these manufacturer's coupons. And I thought, what a man. 
he said, every time I get one for like formula or diapers or bottles or anything, he said, I save them all in a pile here. And he said, I hang on to them. And when a young mom comes through here that needs financial assistance with their babies, I can pull out a whole pack of coupons and say, here, honey, use these. And he said, sometimes they save $50, $70 because I've been saving coupons at my register for weeks waiting on them to come by. And I thought, man, there are heroes everywhere. There are God's people everywhere. I didn't stop and talk to this man about his faith. But I know where that heart comes from. It comes from Jesus. That's the only place. The devil didn't put it there. I'll promise you that. Jesus has expressed himself through that person who's willing to walk humbly in repentance. We think about healing our nation. And we think about revival that just sweeps the nation. And God can do that. And I want him to do that. And I'm praying for him to do that. I'm praying he'll fill churches with people who are praying and repentant people. But I tell you, let's not discount what can happen one at a time. As somebody stands up for truth, one at a time. As somebody saves the life of a baby, one at a time. As somebody just does the right thing in the moment, one at a time. Healing can come. Amen. Would you bow with me today? We're going to close. Jesus, we love you and thank you for this day. And the privilege to serve you. Lord, we desire to turn from our wicked ways. And today, we turn to you. Heads bowed and eyes closed across this congregation. Today's your day to say yes to Jesus. You feel him tugging at your heart. That's the Holy Spirit calling you to him. Not embarrass you this morning. You're here. God's speaking to you. You say, Pastor, today's my day to say yes to Jesus as a Savior and Lord of my life. Can I see your hand quickly? God bless you. God bless you so much. Amen. Amen. Ain't that awesome? Ain't that awesome? Somebody else? Somebody else this morning? Anybody else? How many say, Pastor, I'm a Christian. I know Jesus. There's a sin in my life that I'm ashamed of. And the enemy keeps throwing that up to my face. And today I make the decision, by God's grace, that thing's gone from my life. Never to hit me again. Never to afflict me again. Never to bring shame to my life again. Because I've given it to Jesus. Can I see your hand this morning? Would you hold your hands up high if that's you? I'm giving those things to Jesus today. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. That's awesome. I want to pray with you today. You may be online. If you're online, you can make this very same decision. There's a button there you can push that says yes to Christ, and we'll follow up with you. But we want to pray right now for those saying yes to Jesus. I want you to pray this prayer with us. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. I ask you today, come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. From this day forward, I belong to you. Amen. He's heard your prayer. He's responded with his forgiveness and his love. You said yes to Jesus. If you could text UCF yes to uh, 97000 online, would you do that? And that will let us know of your decision today, and we can follow up with you and help you take some first steps in your walk with Christ, if you would do that. I've enjoyed it so much. been blessed to be with you today. Let me speak blessing over you today. Father, thank you for your people, for the precious people of God called to make a difference in the world. Father, I pray and bless them today with a distinction. God, that wherever they go, the places they go, there'll be a noticeable change in atmospheres around them. That people will know something different, somebody's different. For your very manifest presence to be upon them as they step into their worlds this week. I thank you for it, Father. Now go in the power of the Holy Spirit and proclaim the good news in your world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love y'all so much. Thank you for being here today. Come on.